Well, good morning, church. It is great to see you in worship this morning. We are glad that you're here with us. We want to begin the service today by starting with the ordinance of baptism. Let me invite you to direct your attention to the baptistry waters this morning. Well, good morning. What a joy it is to start with the uh, ordinance of baptism, celebrating one who has come to follow Christ in lordship. Uh, this is Jennifer Lancaster. She and her husband, Clint, and their daughters, Victoria and Giovanna, have been with our church body for some time. But this past uh, Thursday, uh, Thursday evening, Jennifer told me, you know, I don't have my baptism in the right order. I said, okay. And she shared her testimony with me. And I said, well, when would you like to do that? We can do that any Sunday. And she said, Sunday. So I so appreciate her desire uh, to be obedient and to be immediately obedient to what the Lord was showing her. I want to ask you if you're, uh, if you're friends of uh, Clint and Jennifer and their family, if you've been a part of their spiritual journey here at Geyer Springs, if you would stand just to uh, encourage her as we celebrate her commitment this morning. Well, Jennifer, let me ask you this morning, is your testimony that Christ is the Lord and Savior of your life? Because that's your testimony. It's my joy to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in new life. Well, let me invite you to stand with us this morning. If you hadn't had a chance to say good morning to someone around you, take a second. Let them know you're glad to see them in worship this morning. My strength is 
is in your name, Lord. My strength is in your name, for you alone can save. You will deliver me, Lord, is the victory. Who shall I be? Who shall this morning. Well, if the Lord is for you, it really doesn't matter who is against you, does it? We are so glad that you're here. Welcome to worship with us in the worship center here at Geyer Springs. Thank you for joining us and what God is doing here. So good to see obedience through baptism. So good to sing out together to the Lord this morning, and we are just getting started. If you are here today and you are a guest, thank you for being a part of what we're doing. We're so glad that you came to check us out. We would love to have a record of your visit inside of the bulletin. There's a tab that you could complete for us that will give us the opportunity to get to know you and to provide any information about the church that you might like to know about. Also, if you're a regular attender, you can register your attendance that way or online as well. You'll also see on that tab opportunities to request information about ministries of the church and prayer requests. And so the bulletin is going to be central for you to know what's happening around the church this morning. So if you didn't get one, please make sure that you do. There's lots of things in there, but I want to draw our attention to two of them this morning. One is the 2023 proposed budget. God has blessed Geyer Springs with a team of men and women who are faithful to make sure that we steward the resources that we all faithfully give to the Lord's work Sunday in and Sunday out. And so as we do that, the church body takes a voice in that. So please make sure that you grab a copy of the 2023 proposed budget, and there will be discussion next Sunday evening in our prayer gathering at 6 p.m. prior to the time that we pray. And so if you have questions, they're available in the lobby, and you'll get all the information that you need there. Also want to draw your attention to our Raymar Picnic and Harvest Festival. We were blessed with a lot of rain yesterday, which was so good because we needed it. However, it also made conditions at Raymar very soppy and very soggy. And so due to that, we have had to postpone the Raymar Picnic and Harvest Festival. It has been rescheduled. It has been moved to this coming Wednesday night from 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. We have a whole bunch of food, so we might as well grill it and cook it right then. And we would love to have you join us. If you weren't planning to come and Wednesday works, please come be a part of that. It's going to be a really special time. And the weather looks to be fantastic. So we invite you 
Be sure to help spread the word to invite others as well. We'll have a great time out there. There's a social media post on our Geyer Springs Facebook page. If you're on social media, please share that and help get the word out. We'll continue our normal schedule today in that we were planning not to have Sunday school at 11. We are still not having Sunday school at 11. It would be a pretty quick scramble to get that together. So we'll just be dismissed after this service today to go on home. Well, as we continue our time of worship, I do want to draw our attention to a couple of scriptures as well. In the book of Psalms 119, the whole chapter is about the Word of God. And as we prepare our hearts to receive God's Word this morning, listen to just some of the things that the psalmist says here. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. Put false ways far from me and graciously teach me your law. All of the verses in this chapter are consumed with the word of God and its benefits for us. And in a world that we live in where everything is constantly changing and things are getting further and further away from the truth of the Lord, the one thing that we can rest assured in this morning is this book has not and will not change. It is fixed on the character of God and his faithfulness to his people. So we don't rest on feelings, we don't rest on the whims of the world, we rest on the truth and the facts of God's Word. And so the one who has given us this Word to learn from this morning, we have the privilege collectively as a church body to sing to Him, to give to Him, and to pray to Him. So let's take a moment to pray together as a congregation. And as we pray together in a congregational setting like this, most Sundays we're praying for lost, and we've had two more lost names that were submitted. So if you'll bow with me. Right where you sit, if you'll take a moment to pray for Chayla and Tara, would you ask the Lord to open Chayla and Tara's heart to the gospel of Jesus Christ? He's the only one that can open the heart. All we can do is to be faithful to live out the message and share the message. Would you take a moment then to ask that God would use the ones who submitted Chela and Tara's name to have plentiful opportunity to live out that gospel and to speak that gospel to them. Father, in this moment, we thank you for the privilege to gather together as a church body. And we pray that you are exalted high this morning among the the heavens above every other thing that you receive glory from your people here. Father, we pray that your spirit would be working on Chayla and Tara's heart. The one thing we can do is open that heart. That is your job. But God, let those who submitted the names be faithful to be seeking the opportunity to share the good news of you, the good news of Jesus Christ with them. Father, as we continue worshiping this morning, I pray, as I mentioned, in a world just on shaky ground that seems to be faithless and moving towards error, we must be fixed on the truth. So would you use your word in an incredible way in our lives? For some, that word will bring conflict, will bring conviction. I pray they'll receive that. For others, that word will bring much comfort and peace. And Father, I pray they'll rest in that. But Father, your truth demands a response, and today we'll all have to respond to it. So I pray that we all respond accordingly to how your Spirit is drawing us closer into fellowship and relationship with you. Look forward to continue singing to you this morning, Lord. Would you receive these praises from your people? And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 
In 2 Kings chapter 6, we read the story of God's protection of the prophet Elijah from the Syrians. Elijah didn't support the monarchs of Israel, but he knew that it was even worse for Israel to be conquered under Syria. Therefore, he gave the king of Israel information from divinely inspired espionage. In verse 11, the king of Syria asks his servants, will you not tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? The king of Syria couldn't understand how the king of Israel knew all of Syria's plans beforehand. He was convinced that there was a traitor among them until one of his servants revealed that Elijah, the prophet who is in Israel, knew and revealed all these things. So the king of Syria sent horses and chariots and a great army to Elijah's location. Scripture says they came by night and surrounded the city. When Elijah's servant arose the next morning, he saw there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. Obviously, he was afraid as he realized there was little chance of escaping or surviving an attack from so many. Master, the servant said, what shall we do? So Elijah answers, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. This is where we see firsthand Jehovah, Sabaoth, the God of angel armies. Well, the story goes on and the Syrian army, per the prayers of Elijah, were partially blinded and led to Samaria. The words spoken by Elijah are the same words that all the faithful servants of God need to hear today. When you're in the middle of the battle and fighting fear, God says, fear not. For those that are with us to protect us, are more than those that are against us, unspeakably more. And when fear surrounds you, pray as Elijah did, that God will open the eyes of our faith and we may see his protecting hand. For if God is for us, who can be against us? And lastly, this story reminds me that the way I might see my situation is not always how God sees it. Elijah's servant saw the Syrian army with horses and chariots. But the prophet Elijah, he saw God's army, a mountain full of horses and chariots of fire. God, who governs angel armies, has set encampments around me. I will not be afraid.
And hey, with the room like this, maybe you needed to hear that today. Maybe you need to be reminded that God is there every step of the way, and he's surrounding his faithful believers. I will not be moved. I will say of the Lord, you are my strength. You are my shield. You are my portion. God, you are my deliverer. Can we sing this as we close? I will not be moved, and I'll say of the Lord, you are my shield, my strength, my today, God, through the story of Elijah and his servant. God, I pray today that believers who are gathered here this morning, God, that our faith would be in you and you alone. God, that when things may become difficult, God, that you remind us that you are there, you are present, you are surrounding us each step of the way. You are our strength, you're the strong tower. God, you give us all we need when we need it the most. Father, today we respond with worship, with praise. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Thankful for those that are in the venue. I appreciate John and his leadership in worship and Tyler and his leadership in worship and getting us ready, coming before the throne of the Lord, getting us ready for his word. Let me thank you for uh, many, many expressions, uh, very gracious words last week. Glad it's over. We can move on. Here's to the next 30 years. That's not a commitment. Dr. Carl Zimmerman, who is a Harvard sociologist, studied the rise and fall of empires and found a correlation between family life and, and national life. And his work revealed that deteriorating civilizations follow a very definable pattern, and he found five common characteristics in civilizations that unraveled. Number one, marriage lost its sacredness. Divorce became commonplace, and alternative forms of marriage were accepted. Two, feminist movements undermined complementary and cooperating roles as women lost interest in mothering and pursued personal power. Three, parental authority became increasingly difficult. Public disrespect for parents and authority increased. Delinquency and promiscuity became more commonplace. Fourth, adultery was celebrated, not punished. People who broke their marriage vow were admired. And then fifth, there was an increased tolerance for incestuous and homosexual sex with an increase in sex-related crimes. Now, Zimmerman wrote those observations in 1947. He wrote them about other civilizations, but it sure seems that his definable pattern was a thoroughly accurate prognostication of life in the United States in the 21st century. We're there. We are so far down the slippery slope, the best we can hope for is delay, but there will certainly be no recovery. And while we can't change the course of our nation, God's word does tell us how we should live, how we should protect our homes, how we can protect our own little civilizations from destruction. 
We're in Genesis 19 this morning. It's a very dark chapter. It reveals some of mankind's worst qualities. And as much as I would like to skip over this bit of history, God preserved this account for us. There's something to be learned here. I thought this week of Paul's words in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction. And I want to assure you, if you're a parent here in the venue, you have children in the room, I will be as cautious as possible. But the the wretched behavior in Genesis 19 is reflective of our nation today. And it should outrage and, and sicken us. Genesis chapter 19, let me read the first 14 verses. We're going to cover all the way through uh, verse 29 of this chapter, so I'll encourage you to keep your Bibles open as we walk through that verse by verse. Genesis 19, verse 1. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth. And said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house, and they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let, them, let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please." Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn, and he has now become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break the door down. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out, groping for the door. Then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone that you have in the city, bring them out of the place. For we are about to destroy this place because of the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters, up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his son-in-laws to be jesting. I'm not sure what word best describes the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. There are several words, none of them very nice. I guess I would choose the word cesspool because of all the filth that overflowed from these cities and contaminated everything and and everyone around them. These two cities were an economic hub. There was a lot of wealth. There was beautiful architecture. There There was art. But the beauty of the two cities was just a thin veneer over a very ugly underbelly. They were notorious for their depravity, their immorality. Two angels come. These are the same two angels who visited Abraham in Genesis 18. They've now made their way to Sodom. You notice the Lord is no longer with them. When they arrive, it says that they found Lot sitting in the gate. The the gate served two purposes. One, it was the primary entrance into the city. Two, the gate was the place that served kind of as the city hall. In a city gate, leaders or elders would, would gather, they would debate issues, they would conduct business, they would settle disputes, they would gather to give advice to whoever the chief ruler of the city was, give advice on civil matters. So Lot being in the gate reveals that he was not an ordinary resident of Sodom, but he had become an active participant in the political and civil affairs and in the commerce of Sodom. So why had Lot become so active? Why had he become so uh, attached to the city of Sodom? If you remember Genesis 13, when Abraham and Lot chose to separate, Lot initially moved in the direction of Sodom out of greed and selfishness. By this point, he's lived there long enough that there's no doubt he's acutely aware of the excessive depravity, and he's chosen to become a part, an integral part of this immoral, immoral city. Why does he stay? 
He probably stays because of the benefits that he has received financially, but he probably also stays because he can't figure out how to extract himself and his family. Before we completely write off Lot is, is godless, let me mention in the New Testament in 2 Peter, we read these words about Lot. Lot was a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless. Living among them day after day, he was tormented in his righteous soul by the low deeds he saw and heard. It's good to know that the, the godless activity in Sodom bothered him. You know, it's possible that at some point in Lot's sojourn there in Sodom, he was desiring to be a positive testimony for the God of Abraham. Perhaps Lot even thought that he could be an influence, he could entice some of the people of Sodom to turn from their sin and, and to follow God. But there certainly comes a time when you make the decision to shake the dust off your sandals and to move on. The angels come, it says in verse 1, they're, they're still in human form like they were when they visited Abraham. They look like men. There's no halos, there's no wings, there's no flowing white robes, but something in Lot recognizes there's something about them. And so like Abraham, he bows low with his face to the earth. He asks them to come into his home to, to uh, wash the dust from the journey to stay the night. He tells them you can be on your way in the morning. And this, as we saw in Genesis 18, is typical hospitality in the Middle Eastern culture. Look how the angels respond. Nah, no thanks, we'll just hang out here in the town square. Now, angels don't need sleep. They don't need a place to, uh, to stay. It, it appears their intention here was twofold. One is they're going to test Lot. And two is, they want to give Lot a vivid reminder of the incredible depravity of Sodom. He, he's become callous to it. They want to remind him of how depraved Sodom is so that when the time comes, when the Lord truly brings destruction on the city, there will be no surprise and no argument about why God is destroying the city. And Lot knows the city well. In most cities, a stranger could spend the night in the town square and be perfectly safe, but, but not in Sodom. I imagine when Lot heard that these two men were planning to spend the night in the town square, it kind of panicked him. And so he appeals and he prevails and they come to his house and he feeds them. But verse 4 says, before they lay down, the men of the city, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. Look again at that description of who surrounded the house. Young, the men of the city, young and old, all the people to the last man of the city. Everyone was guilty. There aren't even going to be 10 righteous people in the city. Sodom is in complete rebellion and sinful depravity. Verse 5, and, and again, parents, I'm going to be careful here. The men, it says, wanted to know the two men in Lot's house. That doesn't mean they were planning to introduce themselves and exchange contact information. The word know is the same word in Genesis 4 where it says Adam knew his wife and she bore him a son. These men of Sodom wanted to come and take Lot's two guests by force and their intentions were clear. Listen, their moral compass wasn't off a few degrees. Their moral compass was completely smashed and destroyed. There was no shame and no guilt and no remorse in these men. And so Lot goes out and tries to reason with them, and I'm not going to reread his offer in verse 8. It's, it's the stuff of nightmares. It is shameful and disgusting and makes me sick to my stomach. Listen, Lot had responsibility to protect his guests, but no custom and, and no law should have superseded his responsibility to care for and protect his family. He's lived in the cesspool for so long, his mind and heart have become completely twisted. His decision here is beyond comprehension. I feel quite certain every man in this room who has daughters would go to any extreme, even committing an act of violence to protect his daughters. More than one young man in this church has heard me say, I've got a shotgun, a shovel, and acres out back. <laughs> Amen. Let me pause here and say something, something to men who have children and especially who have daughters. The ultimate protection 
you can give your daughter is to have an emotional connection with her. You say that again. The ultimate protection you can give your daughters to have an emotional connection with her. See, guys, when our, when our girls get older, when they get into the preteen years and older, we kind of get, uh, we don't know what to do. We don't know how to hug. We don't know how to speak. Your daughter needs to get her self-esteem and her value from her daddy, not from some young boy who's up to who knows what. He doesn't need to be speaking sweet nothings in her ear. You need to be speaking sweet somethings in her ear. She needs you as her dad. You've got to be fully involved in every aspect of her life. You need to be an example of purity, of upstanding godly character. See, men, when we're an example of purity and upstanding godly character, it raises the bar for what they expect to find in a husband. More than anything else, you need to be suspicious of absolutely every boy that ever comes over to your house. (laughs) Lot's ready to throw his daughter to the wolves, but the wolves have no interest in women. And notice, Lot pleads with them not to do this wicked thing. His plea not to do evil not only falls on deaf ears, but they are angry at Lot calling their behavior wicked. They want to hurt him. And can I tell you, in our current climate, it's becoming more and more common that a person is threatened with bodily harm for calling evil, evil. I shared with you sometime back, you may remember, that my youngest daughter has decided that I'm going to get shot one day. Now, she appreciates my stance on biblical issues like homosexuality and abortion and and other things. She appreciates that stance, but she's afraid I'm going to get shot one day. And I laughed when she told me that and told her, man, what a way to go. (laughs) You see, you know what I think about? I think about Jesus' words in Matthew, don't fear the one who can kill the body. Fear the one who can destroy both the body and the soul. I'm much more fearful of God than I am of men. And so I'm going to say what's true and what's right regardless of the threat. The angels quickly pull Lot into the house. They shut the door. They, they strike all those men with blindness. You know, you'd think if you were struck with blindness, that would get your attention, right? You'd think if suddenly you were struck with blindness, you'd stop what you're doing and, and run a, Well, maybe you wouldn't run away. You'd, you'd get away somehow, right? But look what it says about these men in verse 11. After being struck with blindness, it says, they wore themselves out groping for the door. When you've gone far enough down sin's path, nothing gets your attention. When you've gone far enough down sin's path, you, you are so overcome with the lust to sin that your mind and heart are completely overruled by your desire to do evil. If Lot didn't know it before, at this point, the true nature of the city has been revealed. There is no doubt that the judgment of God on Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding area, no doubt that his judgment is just. In verses 12 through 14, you see the sense of urgency. The angels tell Lot to round up his family, anyone that is important to him, and they need to move quickly because destruction is coming. Well, other than those in his house, the scripture mentions that Lot has two sons-in-law. They're not yet married, but they're engaged to his daughters. You know, I read that, and and that begged the question for me, how in the world did Lot find two men in Sodom that he would give his daughters to? Men, you you need to be involved in that. If some young punk comes into your house and asks for the hand of your daughter, you better do a lot of research and a lot of work before you give your daughter to that man. What what character qualities, what, what sin did Lot have to overlook? What compromise did he have to make to give his daughters to two men of Sodom? Verse 14 says that the son in laws thought he was joking. Lot goes to these two young men, and he tells them that God has revealed to him the city is going to be destroyed. I think they probably found it hard to believe that Lot had any kind of relationship with God, much less a relationship close enough that God would reveal his plans to Lot. And so they laughed. Verses 15 and 16, you need to follow with me now. We haven't read past 14. Verses 15 and 16, the angels are urging Lot to get going. Listen, you wouldn't have to tell me twice. But, but Lot 
lingers. He delays. We, we don't know why. Maybe he's wondering, is God really going to destroy all this, all these people? Maybe he's lingering because he's looking around at all that he is going to lose. But it says the angels grab Lot and his family. No, no, he says they seize, they, they grab Lot and his family by the hand and they drag them to the edge of the city. Why did God do that? Why did he even, if, if Lot was going to linger and Lot was going to question, why didn't he just leave him there to be destroyed? Verse 16 says that God was acting with mercy. He didn't have to spare Lot, but he was being merciful and he was being gracious. And they're taking his mercy for granted. They're, they're weighing God's mercy against their comfortable life. They're deciding what was more valuable to them. So they're just dragging their feet. God is certainly a lot more patient with Lot than I would have been. Look in verses 18 through 22. Not only is Lot taking his sweet time obeying the evacuation order, but in verses 18 through 22, he wants to change the plan of escape. He says to the angels, look, look I, don't, I don't want to flee to the hills. Maybe he was worried because he's having to give up his comfortable life in the city. He's become so entrenched in the, the affluence and the comfort that he delays his departure. Now he's worried about the hardship of living in the hills, of living in the wilderness. So he asks them for permission to go to another city. And I don't know why, but God again is gracious and, and he allows that. Listen, if God ever warns you and tells you that you're in a place of destruction and God gives you a plan of escape, a route to get away from that place, just go. Just go. Don't, don't question his commands. God is omniscient. He knows more than you. He knows better than you. If God says go, get out of this, this is going to destroy you, just go. Take God seriously. Men, I, I'm not picking on you today, but we're the spiritual leaders of our homes. When we don't take God seriously, typically our wife and children don't take him seriously either. Look what happens. Lot and his wife and daughters finally get to Zoar, the little city that God agreed to spare. And immediately God begins to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and all the cities in the valley. It says that sulfur and fire destroyed everything, every inhabitant, everything that grew on the ground, everything in the area was completely annihilated. Look at verse 17, the instruction to flee. Look at this directive that was part of the instruction to flee. Don't look back. They weren't to look back on what had been left behind. There's nothing back there for them, no, no relationships, no possessions, nothing. But Lot's wife didn't take God seriously. She longed for what had been left behind in Sodom. She'd been reluctant to leave. She was bonded to her neighbors. She didn't want to give up her stuff and, and her status. And with that backwards glance, she doomed herself. Verse 26 tells us that she turned into a pillar of salt. And so the destruction ends the next morning. We see in verse 29, Abraham's view the next morning. Verse 29 clarifies God remembered Abraham. Doesn't mean he forgot him. It means Abraham was on his mind and God spared Lot because of Abraham. Because of his covenant relationship with a man that he declared to be righteous. Because of his faith. Now, as within any narrative of Scripture, this story is not just for our entertainment. It's here for a reason. Genesis 19 is a warning regarding God's vengeance and his, his judgment of sin. Now, if you're here this morning and you haven't been around here very long and you don't know me well, let me just say I don't go looking for hot buttons to push. I don't look to pick fights. But on the other hand, I don't shy away from certain biblical issues or passages because they are controversial. And I'll assure you, if, if the truth offends you, there are plenty of churches right here in our area that will protect you from the truth. And in a sin-plagued society, the Bible is controversial and the message is offensive to some. 
But as a pastor, I have the responsibility before God to handle the word of God correctly, and I will stand before him one day and give account, and I will not shy away from the truth no matter how unpopular. That being said, I'm sure there was at this point a great variety of sin in Sodom, but in the account here of Genesis, it makes it very clear that the homosexual lust and behavior brought the severest judgment you see on a city in Scripture. Now, to be clear, every one of us, every one of us are sinners, and we're all worthy of divine vengeance. We're all worthy of judgment. Sin is sin before the Lord. The penalty of, uh, for sin, Scripture says, is death. That, that's for any sin. You know, we, we like to grade or we like to, to rank sins to, to feel good about ourselves because we can compare ourselves to someone else and saying, oh, well, the sin I committed is not as great as the sin he committed or the sins that she has committed. The only comparison any of us need to make is to Christ. And Christ was perfect and he was sinless and we are not we need the forgiveness of Christ so that God is able to look at us through that lens of what Christ did for us on the cross. Because of Christ, God is able to look at us and declare us to be righteous because we stand in the righteousness of Christ. For that to happen, we have to repent of sin. We're all sinners. Scripture's clear that sin is wretched and in the eyes of God, it is punishable by death, all sin. But we have to ask the question, why does God, God's word speak in a much stronger tone about the sin of homosexuality? You know, God has condemned homosexuality throughout Scripture, through every age. Here, here in Genesis 19, the age of the patriarchs, God clearly condemns it. In, in the law of Moses, in the time of the law, the, the period of the law, the age of the law, Leviticus 18 and 20, God condemns it. In the period of the prophets, Ezekiel, 6, Ezekiel 16, God condemns it. In the New Testament, Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 6, Jude 7 and 8, God condemns it. You know, the, the primary uh, New Testament passage in dealing with homosexuality is Romans 1. And if you look at Romans 1, there's an extensive, but not exhaustive, an extensive list of sins. Evil, greed, depravity, envy, murder, deceit, disobedience to parents, hating God. And that's just to name a few. But in that same passage in Romans 1, Paul spends extra words and extra time really singling out, being very clear about the sin of homosexuality. It's in verses 26 and 27 of Romans chapter 1. Why is that? Homosexuality is the worst earthly expression of man's fallenness. Every sin in our lives demonstrates we're fallen, but, but this particular sin is the worst earthly expression of our fallenness. So why do you say that? Well, it's an absolute, complete rejection of God's created order and design. It's total rebellion against the creator. It's saying to God, well, your design is flawed and, and your purpose for mankind is, is senseless. It's a creature putting himself above creator, usurping the will and usurping the, the plan of the creator. You know, the amazing thing, and you know this is true in our day and in our age, although scripture is very clear, those who wish to justify their sin will twist the scripture. And, and many churches, many groups, many denominations who claim to know God have exchanged the truth of God for a lie, especially here. Let's just remember the created order of God. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man, and the word there would mean mankind, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Now look at this. Male and female, he created them. This is a, this is a very clear, totally accurate translation from the Hebrew. He created mankind and then he created two types of mankind. The Hebrew word zaher is male, and the Hebrew word nekeva is female. Those two types. 
God didn't create a third type. He's God. He created. He does what he wants. What he wanted was two types. This is divine creation. In verse 28, after he created them, what did he tell them? Go be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Two men can't do that. Two women can't do that. Genesis 2.24, creation account. He said they were to become one flesh. A man and a woman are anatomically designed to become one flesh. Think about this. I I never thought about this before this week. You know, the the greatest indication of the one flesh design is the product, a child. Two come together, and what do they create? They create one, one flesh. You know, one of those prevalent while we're talking about creation, one of those prevalent explanations for homosexual behavior today is, well, it, it's genetic. There's just a predisposition wired in certain people. They, they didn't choose it. They can't help it. They certainly shouldn't be held responsible. Listen, I don't care what you've heard or read. That lie has never been and will never be proven scientifically. It is a lie. It is an attempt to usurp the spiritual authority of God. Now, what does that have to do with what I said about creation? Well, let's think about this. When God created man, if you read the account in Genesis, when God created man, he declared all of creation, what? Very good. God did not, God would not create anyone with a predisposition to a behavior that he would later condemn. Man chooses to be sinful. If you're involved in habitual sin, be it homosexual sin, be it adultery, your habitual adulterer, it's not a result of genetics. It's not something you can't help. It's not the result of some dysfunction in your family growing up. That, that may have predisposed you, um, may have contributed to the temptation, but it's not your family's fault. Simply sin. Sin is a choice. All sin is a choice. And I want to say again, I'm not picking on one group. We're all sinners. We're all in need of of mercy and grace. All of us must come to Jesus for forgiveness of sins. And when we receive his forgiveness, Scripture says, we will bear the fruit of repentance. We will change. We won't continue in habitual sin. So I want to be sure you hear me clearly today. I'm not trying to heap greater condemnation on one sin than another, but the passage this morning clearly addresses the issue of homosexuality. If I were preaching in Matthew 5 this morning, we'd be talking about adultery. And I'd say the same things. But this passage addresses homosexuality. We can't ignore it. We can't justify it. We can't accept it. We can't keep silent. And I know in a, in a room this size with those watching online, those in the venue, I know there are probably several, if not many, who have a friend or, or a family member involved in homosexuality. I'm not judging them or you. That's not my job. I'm not condemning them or you. I don't have the power to do that. I'm not telling you to judge them. I'm not telling you to reject them. It's not what I'm saying this morning. You know, it seems like any time we say something about homosexuality, people say, well, you're not very loving, you're, you're judgmental. And they might even say, well, that's not what Christ would say. Well, what would Christ say? What, what would Jesus say to someone caught up in sin and living a sinful lifestyle? I know exactly what he would say. Very gently, very graciously, he would say to them, go and sin no more. He said it to the woman caught in adultery. I suppose it'd be loving to not tell someone who is in sin that has heard that God is a God of love. I suppose it'd be really loving not to tell them that God is also a God of holiness and justice. It's supposed to be loving to allow someone to go on in their sin and not tell them that God calls us to repent. 
Listen, I'm not talking, and and you've seen this happen. I'm not talking about screaming at people. I'm not talking about calling them names. I'm not talking about calling down curses on them. But I'm also not talking about watching people silently self-destruct because we're worried about offending them. That's not loving. Everyone in this church who has come to Christ, to come to Christ, you had to be confronted with your sin and you had to recognize your need for a Savior. You can't come to Christ if you don't recognize you're a sinner. You can't come to Christ if you don't recognize your need for a Savior. And I realize, I actually told our staff this morning to really be in prayer. I also told them to pay attention this morning like they never have before. Because I told them it's very likely that I'm going to be misquoted. Someone's going to hear something I didn't say. I realize it's, it's very possible this morning that some of you have been offended and you've tuned me out. Would you just tune back in just for a moment? We are not homophobic around here. We don't hate anyone regardless of their sin. We call out sin because of love. God loves sinners. We follow him, so we love sinners. It's not our job to condemn. That's not what we're doing. Our job is to speak the truth and and, and to warn. The reason we speak of the love and grace of God is so that every sinner knows there is no sin that is too great to be forgiven, there is no sinner that is too horrible, too sinful, that they can't, he can't be accepted. That's why we speak of God's love and God's grace, but we also speak of the holiness and judgment of God to bring conviction, to remind every sinner that destruction awaits those who refuse to repent. That, that's God's word, that's not my word, and I'll tell you, that responsibility is quite sobering. If you're living in sin today, any sin, you don't have to be powerless. You're not hopelessly stuck in your sin. Your condition's not beyond the grace of God. You can turn from your sin. I'll be honest, you you can't do it on your own. You need Jesus. You need salvation. You need forgiveness. You need to have the power of sin over you broken. And all of that is available. Jesus is available. Salvation is available. Forgiveness is available. The power of sin being broken. All of that is available. Would you bow with me this morning here in, in the venue, online? purpose of bowing and closing our eyes is just to remove any distraction. What, what do we do with Genesis 19? How does that speak to us? I mean, this morning you could have said, well, I'm, I'm not involved in that sin, and, and you could have tuned it out. No, there, there's much more here to be said, to be spoken, to be meditated on. So if you're here this morning, you're in the sound of my voice this morning, and you are living in habitual sin, any sin, You need to confess and you need to repent. And and help is available. You don't know what to do. You don't know how to proceed. You don't know the next step. There's plenty of help available. Simply ask. There there are pastors available anytime this morning. There's help available if you're online. You just send us a message. If you are living in habitual sin, you, you know that Jesus said his return would be like it was in the days of Noah and like it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's going to be sudden. And when you look at the depravity in our world today, just like in the days of Noah, just like in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, you have to wonder if it's soon. If you're living in habitual sin. you're not going to want to see Jesus coming. Hey, moms and dads, what's the moral climate in your home? Is it any different than the the neighbor down the street who doesn't know the Lord? You see, Lot and his wife and his family had, had adapted to the moral climate around them. 
become calloused, numb to the depravity around them. What, what's the moral climate in your home? I mean, are you protecting your family? Satan's at the door. You are the defense. You're the one that stands between the wiles of Satan and the destruction he wants to bring, the havoc he wants to wreak on your family. Are you loving your neighbor? Are you thoughtful about their eternity? I don't want us to be an offensive people. I want us to be a loving people. But sometimes we won't even graciously and gently speak the truth because we're worried about offending. I always used to tell students, you're not going to offend your friend into hell number two. Are you willing to speak the truth? So we conclude in just a moment, whatever you need to do, whatever your next step is, your next step may be that you need to come to Christ, forsake sin and come to Christ. Your next step may need to be that you've been visiting here for a while and, and you've decided, you know, we want to be a part of a church that is true to the word of God. You may have a prayer need. You may need someone to give you some counsel. Whatever your next step is, there are pastors available. I'll be at the front here in the worship center. There'll be pastors in the lobby with tags on so you can spot them easily. If you're in the venue, there are pastors in the back by the Next Steps banner. Whatever your next step is, would you not leave here today until you respond to what the Lord has spoken to you? Don't put it off. So... Appreciate Jennifer at the beginning of this service, coming for baptism, not waiting, saying, I need to get this right now. Don't delay. So what has the Spirit said to you today from his word, and how do you need to respond? Father, thank you that you don't hide the bad stuff. In scripture you put all of the failings of, of man out there for us to see because we are men we're made from the dust we're weak we're vulnerable father help us not walk out of this place today not understanding the seriousness of your holiness and your judgment on sin Father, you don't want us to walk before you as a fearful people, but you don't want us to ever forget who you are. You're a loving God. You're a merciful God. You're a God of grace, but you're also a God of holiness and vengeance against sin and justice. Would you help us remember that not only for our lives, but for the people we know who don't know Christ, who are living in sin? Father, I pray for those here this morning who have a, a close friend, a dear friend, a, a family member who is living immorally, living in habitual sin. God, help them as they seek to love, not condemn. Help them to speak graciously the truth. Help them to stay faithful in prayer for that loved one. Father, thank you for Jesus. When I think about how wretched mankind is, the fact that you would send your son, the fact, Lord Jesus, that you would come is just astounding. Help us never to lose the wonder of what you've done for us. And because you've come and you've been willing to take our sin on yourself because you've been willing to die for us. Help us to faithfully live for you. Help us to be that living sacrifice that is pleasing and acceptable. Spirit of God, speak to us. 
help us to obey. Pastor, for the word he brought this morning. Thankful for the truth being proclaimed today. Remember, do not go to Raymar for lunch, okay? There will be no food, and you'll be the only one there. Hope you have a great week. Wednesday night, 5.30 to 7.30, we'll make up the Harvest Festival. See you then. Have a great rest of the week. Hey, Pastor Tyler here. Thank you so much for joining us online for our venue service today. We are so thankful that you chose to gather with us online and we would love to connect with you and your family. There's a couple ways you can do that. 
One way is to scan the QR code on the screen and follow the instructions. Or if you want to go to gsfbc.org slash check-in, you can follow the links there as well. Once again, we just want to say thank you for being with us today. And if you want, we would love for you to join us next week at 930 here in the venue. Or if you want to join us online at 11, that would be great as well. We hope you guys have a great rest of the week.